the talk for 12.30 will be starting as of now. So please give a round of applause to Lee Brotherston. <laughs> I read that for the first time today. Hey, hey thank you. Uh, so this is, well, it's my glorious celebration of IoT security, as you can see. Um, these are the objectives I kind of want to cover today. Uh, an introduction, which in part is this. Um, then we'll go into some challenges of IoT, why problems occur, and um, about how we're doing a security. Um, so the background on this is very much that, um, as I'll show in a minute, there are, there are certain IoT talks and IoT types of talk that come up frequently. Um, but I think that very often the root cause is not always addressed. So this is aiming more to talk about the root causes and how those problems get established in the first place rather than popping shells and, and actually demonstrating exploits. So who am I and why am I talking about this? Well, I'm a security person, uh, not an IoT person by trade. Um, I typically work on the defense side of things. Um, you know, day job is, is being a defense person. But more specifically, I'm a security person in an IoT company, specifically Ecobee, um, but this equally applies to things I've learned from sort of industry type events and that sort of thing. Um, and really, this is, um, this is the reason I want to talk, because I think that a lot of IoT companies do not have security teams, and a lot of people that give uh, uh, talks at conferences are not from IoT companies, so I feel like it's hopefully a unique perspective. Apologies if it's not. Um, so, at the minute, existing talks to me fall into a few, sort of three broad categories a lot of the time, and that's great, but um, I wanted to do something different. The categories being, hey, like, there's an old thing because IoT devices run like Linux from five years ago, so here's a redoing the five years ago Linux exploit talk. There's normal web app stuff that just happens to be on an IoT device. Or the common one, which is the, so with physical access to the hardware, I can do a thing. And these are legitimate in a lot of cases. But if we're talking about threat modeling, you know, um, with physical access to big, some big industrial thing, like, that's great. That, but if you've already broken into my house, I don't really care if you can reflash my DVD player. That's, like, not really the threat model that I'm going into. So, um, God, DVD player showing my age now. Um, but... The <laughs> But the point is that um, that's often not a threat model for most people. IoT, maybe not exclusively, but for the most part, we're talking about consumer devices in a consumer home. We're not talking so much about industrial control. We're not talking about production line. We're not talking about like airlines and public transit and all that kind of stuff. So because of that perspective that a lot of people take, it often focuses on the impact of the hack rather than the root cause. I know I'm generalizing. I'm not meaning to shoot anyone down there. Um, is often largely presented by people outside of IoT just because there are not that many people in security in IoT. And there's also guesswork because people are, uh, by definition, they're having to reverse engineer things. They don't work in the companies. They don't have access to the source code. Uh, they don't have access to schematics. So they're taking devices apart, dumping firmware, that sort of thing, uh, which is awesome. But it does involve a certain level of guesswork and inference. Um, so we've seen the headlines. Uh, this mostly covers the sort of stuff we're seeing. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has an interest in IoT and so has seen these. Although these are slightly dated, so to revamp my slides, these are now the headlines that we see, uh, focusing very much on the Alexas and Google Homes recording things and oh my god, privacy, etc. Um, a pretty good base for the main problems, is, and not a lot of people seem to realize this, is that OWASP have done an IoT specific top 10. Um, and it's actually pretty good. And based on what I've seen um, both within my own organization and other organizations, I would say it's a fairly uh, representative and characteristic overview of the, the core issues. I'm just going to switch the slide because this was a screen cap of their pretty graphic. This is the same top 10, just in text you can read. Um, you probably know them, but we're just going to super quickly skim over them. So weak, hard-coded, or guessable passwords. I'm pretty sure you'll have seen a talk here already today where some hard-coded token be can be reused. Uh, insecure network services, so that's like old versions of demons, old HTTPDs and stuff. Um, insecure ecosystems as a whole, because most of these devices, are, I'm guessing when you buy them, you're not using in isolation. Uh, they often talk to a mobile app, to some like web service or something. 
lack of secure update mechanism. This is a big thing because um, IoT devices often don't get updates or they've got a terrible update mechanism when they do. Um, insecure and outdated components. I believe this is, is software components. We're not really talking about out of date capacitors and such like. Uh, privacy protection it is fairly non existent in many, many areas. Um, and the same with sufficient data transfer and storage uh, protection. Uh, device management is mostly referring to the fact that you can't adequately do things like um, like network config, uh, being able to set passwords, being able to set cryptography on like uh, appropriately on Wi-Fi connections and that sort of thing. Then in insecure defaults and lack of physical hardening. Um, like I said before, like physical hardening is very much threat model dependent, so I'm not going to delve into that one too much. But really, the, the crux of this is like why. Um, so there are a few areas, and I'm just going to delve into each of them. I've broken it down into sort of four broad topics. So first of all, there's the company. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit more into a bit more into detail on that. But there are effectively three types of company that make IoT devices right now. When we're looking at like consumer IoT devices, so you've got dedicated IoT companies, the companies where like their core product or their flagship product lines are IoT devices. That's what they do. Uh, you've got tech companies who often make larger sort of commercial grade um, equipment. So think, you know, big network provider who's like, I'm going to do a consumer offering, make it a smaller, uh, simpler IoT device. And then you've got a third type, which is a traditional player in some other market. So I'm talking um, when a lock manufacturer decides to do IoT door locks or a, a kettle manufacturer does an IoT kettle or whatever. It's like tech is not actually their their product. They're, they're sort of diversifying into that. And I'll come back to that. Um, there's a product development life cycle. Uh, that causes a bunch of issues just by the very design of how it has to work. And we'll go into that. Uh, there's actually some logistics uh, issues. Um, and finally, no, second to finally, there's economics, which I know this is not really an economics uh, conference, but there are some economic reasons. I'll touch on that. Hopefully, it'll enlighten a little bit. And then there's just straight up technical stuff. So to look at the third company type, the people that work in a non-tech company that are diversifying. So this is a real photo uh, from Dave's toaster manufacturer company. Uh, they make toasters. And they realize that you know, they've got to diversify their market a bit. Uh, toasters are kind of for old guys. Um, and they, they want to broaden out. So they start thinking about the millennial market so they can get their avocado toast on. Um, and, and they think like, OK, so how can we do this? Well. We, we know how to make toasters, and we need to appeal to like the kids. And like I hear that guy in IT can do an internet, so we can probably like stick these things together and make an IoT device. We should do an IoT. Oh, we should do an IoT. There you go. So we'll get a toaster. That's cool. We know how to do that. Uh, we'll kind of like duct tape a Raspberry Pi to it, or some similar, some Arduino, whatever. It may be prototyping, but I've seen things that end up literally like this for real. Um, yeah, and then we'll just apply some duct tape, and like it'll all be fine, and we can like enter into new markets and become ridiculously rich. So what does that work out like? Well, it, something like this probably, um, but it, it's not so far from the truth, worryingly. And that at least these taken it a little further. They've put an Alexa on there, so voice activated. Awesome. And of course, that's never caused a problem before, ever, for anyone. Um, there is the incident of, of, yeah, of a door locking manufacturer who didn't really know about uptime and didn't really know about whether to fail open or fail closed. So the locks just stopped working during an outage, which was amazing. Um, and obviously, they offer, they haven't thought through issues. Um, partly safety and legal issues as well. Like, do you want to fail to unlocking everyone's door or locking everyone in the house during a fire? Uh, neither of those are sort of great situations. Um, but yes, that's how they work sometimes. Um, this is from Tesla, where you can't drive your car because you need an update. Um, again, you know, probably not exactly the user experience that people are looking for. And yes, this was, this was uh, the backlash from Yale specifically uh, from people who were not super duper happy about the situation when they couldn't use their door anymore. Um, and so how does this stuff happen? So this is actually 
the hardware life cycle for people that work in hardware design and manufacturing. So the little loopy bit at the beginning is the closest you will ever come to Agile in hardware. Um, this is where people are sat in a lab and they're taking components off and on, uh, on and off of a breadboard and like moving wires around and that sort of thing and iterating on their design to make a hardware design that works. And then it naturally goes through a few stages. People make real PCBs. Um, you know, they 3D print a chassis. They make little prototypes that are good enough for you to test functionality in-house, but they're still not quite the real thing. And they go through this loop until you land on a fairly, fairly solid um, design. At that point, you go into EVT. Um, that's uh, engineering validation and testing. So this is the hardware equivalent of uh, functional requirements testing. You're going through and saying, does it do the thing that we designed it to do? And you're also doing things like getting certifications because hardware manufacturers don't just have to make it do what it says it does. Unlike software, uh, there are things like um, electrical safety standards testing and thermal testing and RF emissions testing and all that kind of thing. So that all happens during this phase. Um, and what that means is that there are certain changes that will have to happen to hardware and certain things that cannot change in hardware because you have to you know, meet these requirements or fix a shortcoming. Um, what that means is that you effectively, from a hardware perspective, have what is like a software change freeze. Um, the reason I mention this is that until this point, people don't like developing the firmware. So uh, the firmware development lifecycle is not as long as you may think, um, because during this lead-up point, hardware is changing. If you're trying to write device drivers in software and you're constantly changing it because someone's like YOLO switching some component out that no longer, you know, different chipsets and stuff, um, it, it causes all sorts of havoc with that. But then once you've frozen it, then the, the reverse is true. You can develop all you like, but if you find a problem in your software that requires a hardware change, good luck to you, because like, it's not happening. Certifications have happened. Things are not being retested. Um, then there's design, validation, and testing. This is a little bit more like QA. Um, and then PVT, which is uh, product validation testing. Um, so that is, uh, sorry, not product, production validation testing. So that's stuff coming off the, the, the line um, that uh, gets tested to say, OK, the samples worked. Are they coming off mass production looking what we expected? Um, but what that means is that uh, firmware needs to be developed after the hardware is constantly changing, but be on there and working before you're testing stuff coming off the, the production line. So you've actually got a relatively narrow gap during which you're sh shopping out firmware, because firmware has to be on the device when you're shipping it to consumers. And then you're into mass production. And so like I just said, Building hardware is a few areas. So there's PCB fa fabrication, that's physically making the boards, uh, sourcing and shipping components, uh, which if you've read any headlines on supply chain stuff, that's its own part, bit of fun. Uh, there's assembly, which is often completely different plant. Um, build and quality testing uh, is literally just like, well, exactly what it sounds like. Uh, making cases and accessories, so that's the, the pretty touch screens and the boxes are in and everything, and then packaging and shipping. So getting a little bit more technical, but not super duper technical. Um, hardware actually changes what languages you can use. So uh, I'm sure you're all aware you don't run massive like 32 core x86 processors in IoT devices. They're normally ARM or MIPS uh, for the most part. Uh, there might be some other stuff, but you know that's predominantly the, the, the uh, architecture. Um, that leads to, to various constraints, not just in hardware, but you've got processing power, you've got things like the amount of addressable memory, you've got the cost of getting the memory into the devices and all these things. So you're very often resource constrained. Um, additionally, you're probably running some embedded Linux, like a BusyBox or whatever, because no one actually writes their own OS. Everyone takes a base OS and tweakifies it a bit. Same as in big vendor land where they inevitably take Linux or BSD or something and just tweak it. Um, so then you've got the resource constraints, which means you've only got so much memory and so much processing you can do, which means that things like encryption and um, not writing things to volatile storage and that sort of thing gets a lot more difficult, which in terms of things like managing keys and that sort of thing is also challenging. And I'll come back to that in just a sec too. Uh, you've also got kernel drivers and black box drivers, which are super fun because some chipset manufacturers, even when you're putting their chips into your hardware yourself, 
pull the thing that any of you that run Linux with a graphics card are used to, where it's like, source, ha ha ha, no, binary driver, off you go, good luck. Um, so you end up running like bits of code that you may not even understand um, yourself on your hardware. And as I mentioned, like key management is hard. It's like super duper duper hard. And if key management is hard and you're used to key management being hard, IoT key management is harder. Um, and why is that? Well, it's what I just mentioned about the hardware lifecycle, right? So how are you going to ship the keys? Am I going to say I'm not putting any keying material on devices? Or am I going to say I'm going to put a shared key on device because I have to give that shared key to some fabrication facility that I don't own in God knows where, um, are they going to have that key and put it on the devices? Or do the devices get individual keys, which we know is like way better, all the devices having individual keys, but does that mean that I have to give them some kind of root cert to sign all the individual keys? Because that also sounds like an unfun idea. Or you can go the Tofu route, which is the trust on first use, where devices do not have any keying material at all, and they're just set on first boot up to go grab some keys, which is great because you've not exposed your key material to an external third party, but it is a little bit of an issue in that when your device is plugged in, it has no keying material, and then you're at risk of things like if things are man in the middle on first use, you know, and that sort of thing. Next up is software supply chain. Um, so, as you're aware, these are typically like little Linux boxes, and they run some processes that rewrote. They'll run processes that are part of the OS. Uh, they'll probably run some random OpenSSL version or whatever, too. Um, and what you start to realize is that you have inadvertently become an OS vendor because you took that, that base Linux and went like, that's great, but the OpenSSL is out of date. I'm just going to update mine. Suddenly, you're no longer using the base version. You can't just be updating the base version. You're updating whole, f updating whole firmware images. Also, unlike things like Mac OS or Windows or something where you're used to vendors pushing updates, if you install compile, build, and install an embedded Linux system, most of them are not doing OS updates at all. Package management, nothing. Um, which means that the uh, IoT vendors have to do those updates uh, and package it in, which is sometimes, I think, a thing that people don't anticipate, that they are now becoming like a whole OS vendor, effectively. A small OS, but a whole OS vendor. And then you get f stuck in the uh, dependencies route. Um, Another fun thing, if any of you are developers, is water agile full development. Um, um, because, like, most IoT companies are like these young startup, like, agile's awesome, microservices and AWS and ah, everywhere. And, you know, that's great. Like, that is a great way of doing things right now. Um, however, you can't modify hardware on the fly anywhere near as easily. The closest you can come is reflashing firmware. There is no, hey, would you mind yanking your thermostat off the wall, switching these chips out? No, you're great and ready for the next version. Like, that's not going to happen. So you somehow have to manage agile development at the back end. So like APIs, mobile apps, all that sort of thing, um, with uh, what's effectively waterfall me methodology for the, uh, the actual hardware itself that this is running on which leads us into the pain of logistics. And this is actually where I think a lot of IoT companies get their issues. So you have things, and they are in places. Uh, those things being the IoT devices that, as a company, are shipping to consumers. And then places are places. So uh, there's the factory they're built in. Uh, there's things like the warehouse, because um, we don't all ship direct people. They sit in like. Costco or an AWS warehouse or something, AWS warehouse, God, an Amazon warehouse or something like that. Because um, consumers, you know, want to buy from a variety of places, not direct from vendors. This poses a small issue because the time to thing being online is unknown. That means if I write firmware that has an inherent vulnerability in it that needs to be fixed by disabling something on it or killing an API endpoint for me, um, I can't do that because there may be some device in a warehouse that's not going to be plugged in for six months. If I kill the vulnerable API uh, endpoint and then someone plugs it in in six months and it's a brick, I am going to be shot by someone. So, you know, you have to keep that online. You have to find alternative methods of securing it. Uh, similarly, um, devices themselves, you know, we send firmware updates to them and everything, but on first connection, they're still going to be running that six-month-old version of firmware or whatever it was that was put on at the factory. Um, 
The other thing is you don't know the geography of the thing at the time. Um, and by that, I mean... Um, if you have various um, methods of updates, they don't all work everywhere. So, um, for example, if you're putting things into a corporate environment, there's often things like proxies and firewalls and stuff in the way. And unlike um, when you're getting big commercial gear put in, um, there isn't a whole, these are your requirements for opening up your firewall that people read. Like, consumers plug it in and hope it goes. If they're blocked, they're blocked. And we probably aren't going to get updates to them. Uh, and speaking of which, like, if anyone remembers what this is, um, so that's about as frequently as users will update if you don't make that automatically happen for them. So if things are not uh, updating on their own, then all those previous problems I mentioned, they're just going to stay. Like, they're not going to change. And then people like Bloomberg pull this stuff, um, which was <laughs> fucking annoying. Uh, anyway, so... As a heads up, if you start working in an IoT company and this headline comes out shortly afterwards, you're in for like the least fun week of your life. Um, but effectively, this got debunked. Uh, not debunked that it could happen, but debunked that it did happen. Um, there are a couple of talks um, out there that are really worth watching if this is an area you're interested in. And the TLDR is this is like supply chain attacks, like fabrication plant switch chips, oh my god, the NSAs or Chinese government or whatever, panic. Um, and people proved that they could happen, but um, uh, Falcon Darstar did a talk, uh, Shmukon, uh, which is really good, that shows that there's, there's probably a bunch of other areas uh, in the supply chain that would be way easier to, to achieve this with. And actually, some of the QA checks catch way more of this than you would think they would. So on to the, uh, onto the economics part and the Bordens. Uh, this is because we're a Canadian company and we don't have Benjamins, so this is our equivalent. Um, so... You've got the retail price um, of a piece of hardware. Um, so, whatever. Just imagine a number. You're going to take some taxes out of that because we have to pay some taxes. Uh, the retailer takes a chunk because they don't do it for free. Sh shipping and packaging, take that out of the price. Uh, take out the physical parts and the labor to build it. Uh, recouping some R&D costs, because of course you're not making any money whilst you're designing a device. You only make money when you sell it, so you've got to recoup those costs. There's marketing, because it's all pretty blinky, ads all over the place, there's Facebook banners to pay for and whatever else. And oh yeah, hopefully some profit at the back. So that's like your fixed costs. Um, if you're a subscription service, you're lucky. You can probably roll the rest of your costs into the subscription. But if you're buying a device where you buy the device and that's it, the following also has to come out of the cost of that device. Oh, sorry, wait, no subscription revenue? Uh, so one, tech support. You probably want to be able to call someone and get support. Those people need to be paid, as do the phone lines. Uh, customer service uh, for complaints, because people love IoT. Um, and then you've got replacements and returns. Those cost money. Uh, hosting and bandwidth and uh, APIs and all that stuff in AWS. Uh, building the free mobile app you're planning to use. And uh, the free online portal. And then, having deducted this entire list and the profit that the company probably wants to keep, with what's left, you can patch and update and do future development. You can operate your security team. You can pay for your pen tests and your bug bounties. People sometimes wonder why security work doesn't get done. This is actually a large part of it for people. Like, you have to pay for that stuff, and there's only so much. And um, if you want to do more, you're going to jack up prices or cut from somewhere else. Um, so let's quickly talk updates, because I've just seen the time. Um, this is uh, BMW's update process as published on the website. Um, how many of you do this with your car regularly? I'm guessing probably close to zero, maybe when it's in the shop or something. Um, so let's talk updates. Ideally, you want to do over-the-air signed updates that can't be rolled back to previous versions so people can only move forwards, they know it's safe from the vendor, uh, and it's over-the-air and works, and great. P.S. That's what we do. Yes! Um, a lot of the time, that's not the case. Uh, often, it's over-the-air, manually initiated and signed, if you're lucky. Um, over-the-air, manually initiated. You're probably used to this with, like, Wi-Fi access points or something. You, it does the other uh, updates. Yeah, their updates. Fine. Clicky, clicky. Um, there's manually uploaded binary, which is the case with that BMW. 
Uh, a USB stick? Uh, none. Um, a lot of them fall into none. Um, sometimes devices are end of life and they just don't care. Uh, sometimes they haven't thought through update processes, but like, not thinking this through makes it very hard to fix because how do you put a new update service on something that doesn't have an update service? Uh, it's a common pitfall anyway. And speaking of updates, like updates, uh, updates can go wrong. You've probably seen these in your life somewhere. Uh, why is that bad? Well, in IoT, bad updates are bad. Number one, it's non-tech users that get them, right? Uh, it's often people who have no awareness of what's actually happening under the hood. So they're not going to fix it if it goes wrong. And if it goes wrong, the devices are often a brick. It's not like Windows or something where it goes, hey, would you like to go into safe mode and fix it mode or whatever else? Like, a brick is a brick. And when that's something like a door lock, a thermostat, uh, light switches, like people don't like brick devices for some reason. Um, it also makes Agile hard. Um, so when people say it takes a long time to fix vulnerabilities, often this is why. There's like a ton of testing because you have to test the upgrade from every version of firmware to every version of firmware on every version of hardware. If you don't, things just stop. And that's bad. Um, and there's also, uh, we have to uh, be conscious of the environment. So we recycle, refurbish an RMA, uh, RMA's returns. Um, this also makes it hard um, because we have to handle the process of being able to get new devices out to customers. And fi not finally, almost finally, getting finally. Uh, so there's low friction deployment. Um, you will know that like the magic, if any of you have bought Apple, especially the Air, AirPods, for example, it's magical. You open the box and your phone goes like, ah, oh, you bought a thing, use a thing. Like, that's the end of it. That's what, like, everyone's shooting for in this department. They don't want people to be like, oh, and then I have to cable a thing and then plug in this other cable, then push this code, blah, blah, blah. Like, people want to just go like, oh, I got this cool device, plug it in, works, done, great. So it brings in, like, this box. And you see these triads all over the place in security. You can do all these, that's great absolutely no chance of getting all three nailed. It doesn't happen. Uh, and so you have to pick which one, uh, which one uh, is removed. And for many people, that is security. I would like to think not us, but it is often the case. But it's not all bad. Uh, some companies are waking up. Some companies are getting abysmal press and being forced to wake up. And public awareness is moving up, which is forcing the hand of people. So in summary, everything's fine. Don't worry. Like, it's all good. Um, I am like two minutes away from being done, so like thanks for your time, and if there's any questions, I would love to take them. Otherwise, just thank you. I'll take it as a no. <laughs>